Um, I think people are still joining, but let me just start. Um, so, um, hi everyone. On behalf of Ideas, I'm very excited to have you all today for our weekly webinar. Today is actually uh, not Saturday as usual, today is Wednesday, and we have a lovely speaker, Bean Fan. Today's topic is um, data virtualization, but before we jump into the webinar, let me just briefly describe, as we usually do, what is Ideas, what we do, why we do that, and what is our mission. So, um, I hope everyone can see my slides. So, in Ideas is International Data Engineering and Science Association. We are a nonprofit organization, um, and we are bridging the gap between academia um, and industry. What we do is actually we are um, we share this enthusiasm and we connect those people who are um, data science engineering, data science engineering and blockchain um, leaders with other people. So we just um, pretty much very excited about data science, um, machine learning, big data and blockchain. And we, wa we want to share this kind of things with others who want to share ideas and thoughts. So we started, this is our roadmap, we started 2016. We started in USC campus. We had our so-called conferences. And we also started um, to grow across the country. So we have our um, conferences in Chicago, New York, in Boston. Apart from conferences, we also help meetups. Um, in different universities as MIT, Harvard, and also UC. Um, this is our photo gallery. This is the very first one, so called conference at UC. Um, this is the New York blockchain leadership. Um, this is Chicago blockchain leadership. And this is so called conference in Pasadena. And that one is the last one, so called conference, very big one in Los Angeles Convention Center. We had uh, around 300 speakers. It was very interesting, the huge event. And I also think that it was a very powerful event. Some great ideas were shared there. Um, so as I told you, um, apart from conferences, we also do hackathons and we also have um, different meetups in different universities at Harvard, MIT, um, and different hackathons. And um, yeah, this is our um, different photos from different mixers and meetups. So if you want to learn more about ideas, this is our website, ideas.ssn.org. You can email us and you also can subscribe for our weekly newsletter to get more information about different webinars. So we have webinars um, weekly on Saturday usually. And um, we also have our YouTube channel. This is the QR code. Um, you can find um, pretty much everything there. So each webinar we just post there. And Today, um, let me just introduce our wonderful speaker for today. Uh, his name is Bin San. He's a founding member of Alluxior, uh, formerly known as Daikon, the world's first memory speed distributed storage system. Prior, prior to Alluxior, uh, Bin San worked at Google, so where he was building the next generation storage infrastructure. He also um, did his PhD in Carnegie Mellon University. Um, I think he worked there to design uh, and implement, implement the um, distributed system of algorithms. Okay, today Vince is going to share how Alexio helps big data and machine learning to uh, be cloud native. So welcome, Ben. Um, we're very thankful for um, your webinar today. And um, yeah, we're glad to have you. Thank you so much. I'm going to stop sharing, so I'll pass it to you. Thank you, Dahlia. Uh, let me just try to share my screen. Yeah, let me let me know if you see my slides. Yeah, we can we can see your slides. And um, just um, just just a quick note. So everyone who has a question during the um, slides, because Bin wants to do it more interactive. So if you have any questions in the Zoom, just go ahead and type in into our chat or just um, in the question and answer special box. Yeah, I'm gonna read it out. No worries. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Dalia. Let me just try to start. Uh, thanks for the introduction. My name is Bin. Uh, as the previous mentioned, I'm right now working in Alux as a founding member. And previously, I was, I'm actually, I've been in a storage, distributed storage or distributed system the space for a while uh, since my PhD years. And today, the topic I'm trying to present is about data virtualization 
for any stack and any cloud. And this is really about the overview for um, like first it consists of observation we have uh, into the industry trend in the past 10 years and how do we address, we meaning the industry, uh, address uh, industry in big data and the machine learning uh, to address this challenge and also our thinking, our reasoning about uh, one solution which is Alexio and I can do some, I will also do some demo to show how to use it on a single machine uh, to show you how to make data virtualized to your single machine. Okay, uh, as mentioned previously, we want this speak, want this presentation to be interactive whenever you have any question, uh, feel free to stop me. I'm like, I like to stop, I like to stop and also to try to address your questions right away. Okay, I'll try to go to the next slide. So essentially, um, what we see in the last decade, there is a lot of development, a lot of advancement in the big data ecosystem. So uh, starting from actually early 2000s, Google published three papers uh, in the top academia conference like SOSP and OSDI. Uh, these top conference, these papers are about Google file system, uh, which is the way Google thinks how to store bytes cheaply and you can scale this capacity horizontally by adding more commercial machines, commodity machines to this service. And you also, they've also published the papers like a big table and also MapReduce talking about their way to, to store uh, structured data and also their way to prov provide a distributed computation engine. And starting from there, the community in the big data world start to think about, oh, this is a great model. We can maybe try to make something similar to the idea because Google didn't at that time open source the implementation. They share their design ideas and their uh, like design lessons learned in the paper but the, the source code or the binary are not available, generally available for um, the public audience. So yeah, so people from the industry thinks this is a great idea, let's try to build system, set up systems following this model and try to uh, solve this problem outside Google and using the open source model. So since then, we see a lot of advancement in the big data world, especially in the Hadoop ecosystem. And in the early days, there's only one choice, which is you use the MapReduce as the computation and use Hadoop, HDFS Hadoop, as your, um, as, as your uh, storage engine to, uh, to cheaply store bytes. And that time, um, basically the core idea is we should deeply couple the compute and the storage and leverage data locality as much as possible. So this may sound too um, technical, but essentially the idea is, let, instead of let's moving data from where it is needed, let's move compute the source code or the binary to where it should compute data. And in that way, we can just do some locality, do some compute lo lo locally. Yeah, so this is the early idea about Hadoop and it gets a lot of advancement since then. And we see nowadays after 10 or 15 years development, we see a lot more in this landscape. If you want to solve big data problems, you have a lot more tools like Presto, Spark, Flink, and they all emphasize or focus on solving one particular problem in some um, particular area. Like Presto is pretty good in low latency, big data SQL queries. Uh, Spark is more like a next generation of MapReduce. It, it is a general, general framework for compute. Flink is more emphasizing on uh, streaming, at least that, that's the initial design idea. Yeah, so we, we see way more different choices to do the computation. And on the storage side, we also see more and more different ways you can store your data. For example, uh, nowadays it's very popular to use AWS S3 as the, uh, as the way to store data because it's cheap, it's scalable. If you want more capacity, you just pay more, right? And also, for example, Google and Amazon or, or Microsoft Azure provide similar um, storage. And Hadoop HDFS is still there, it's still evolving. And traditional storage vendors are also jumping into this battle and they try to make their devices or boxes more similar to Hadoop 
what Hadoop can do. So they also provide, uh, like for example, distributed storage service to different computation engines. So uh, essentially from this diagram, you can see that we see more and more different choices in both compute and storage nowadays. And this creates problems. And first problem is uh, we know a lot of compute, they are, most of the compute actually they are CPU bound. If you want more compute power, which means you should buy more CPUs. On the other hand, the storage is usually IO bound. If you want more storage bytes, more capacity, you should buy more hard disks, or maybe in, if, you, if you're rich, you can buy more memory or more SSDs. But essentially, these are two very different resources. Compute and storage are very two very different resources. But the original way in the industry is to combine them together. Okay, for example, in the Hadoop cluster, if I want to increase my CPU, my compute resource, I will, add, I will need to add more nodes into this service, which means I also need to buy more hard disks because each node is equipped with both CPU and hard disk, and they are supposed to do both compute and storage. That the whole idea how deeply coupled storage compute following the Google GFS model. And this, is, this gets problem because now you have to scale this. You cannot scale uh, your compute resource or scale your storage resource independently. If I just need to get more CPUs, I have to buy more resource for the storage and vice versa. If I need more storage, I, if I want to store more bytes, I also need more CPUs, which may not really be the bottleneck for my workloads. So basically having them deeply coupled creates all this problem. And it's very inflexible for a lot of people, for example, the data admins or system admins to um, do the planning, resource planning, or when they are doing some maintenance work or doing um, more optimization into this topology. It just creates a lot of trouble. It gives a lot of in in efficiency, but also creates a lot of problems. Uh, so far, any problem? Any question? Um, so far, so good. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Sounds good. Yeah. Um, so we want a lot of, in, currently, like in the past 10 years, in the past few years, a lot of people are looking at a different angle to solve this problem. Essentially, all different uh, new trends in the industry pointing to one direction, which is to uh, we should scale this compute and storage independently. Let me translate this into different words. So essentially, we should have different set for machines for compute and a different set of machines for storage only. And we should not deeply couple them together so that we have one machine, one box for both compute and storage. Instead, we should have resource pools for compute and the resource pool for storage. And we should find a way to connect this resource pool to get to move either bytes to compute, so to move the bytes to the compute where it's needed. And why this is important for a lot of users. The first, this can duplicate, this can reduce the data duplication uh, by using the same storage, using the same storage as a source of choose for multiple different uh, compute frameworks. So uh, give you one example, like I observed in many different companies, they do have one source of choose, which is they have a main HDFS or S3 uh, to store the data, but they want to launch different applications. Like for example, one application for machine learning, I want to run deep learning on this, this set of data. The deep learning requires a very different set of machines. They should be very GPU heavy machines. They have a lot of GPU powers to uh, do the training work, model training work, for this deep learning training, deep learning training. And uh, so this definitely, this, this, this job definitely belongs to some specialized uh, cluster. And usually they are very expensive. You can check out how uh, like the stock, well, the stock price for NVIDIA in the, in the last year, you see how much they go higher, you know, like how much money they make from the GPUs. And essentially, um, this is basically, they require special hardware to do some certain compute. And there might be some other applications 
it just requires normal GPU, uh, normal CPUs to finish. For example, there's log analysis or running some uh, normal SQL queries. They don't really require GPUs, but they still want to share the same set of data. And with the new uh, decoupled storage and compute model, it's much easier to plan the resource and much easier to manage the topology, right? Uh, uh, in the, actually, it ended up with, for a lot of companies, they just have this uh, source of choose main HDFS cluster, and they launch, for example, these 40 machines running Presto or Spark SQL, big, basically big data queries, or these other five machines, 10 machines with a lot of GPUs to run deep learning frameworks. So in this way, uh, you can spare out different, we call the satellite CPU or satellite, satellite computation clusters, but they all connect into one source of truth. And this makes the life of data, machine, data engineer much easier. And the other reason people are going to this direction to have independent storage compute is because um, there are new storage cheaper than the previous ones, like S3. A lot of, uh, so nowadays if you go to a new companies, new startups, it's very, very likely that in their infrastructure is built on top of certain public clouds on day one. So they don't really need to handle all this, uh, buying all this physical servers, so physical machines, and manage these physical machines and, uh, and networking issues. So don't bother to do this. Usually people just don't just build their infrastructure on cloud on day one. And in this case, you have cheap and newer storage like object stores for big data and AI workflows available for big data and AI workflows. They're designed to store a lot of many objects, big or small. So in this way, uh, people are, so this is for the newer companies and for the larger and existing maybe legacy companies, they also, there's a very, very uh, stronger and stronger trend we're seeing in the Valley that people are moving their workloads, their data to uh, cloud, to S3. A lot of companies are taking, are taking steps into this transition right now, uh, figure, for figuring out what's the best way to leverage a uh, cloud resource, at least using cloud storage to, uh, for, for example, some code data that they don't really want to store in their HDFS capacity. So they want to spare more by there. And there's, this is definitely something, a uh, very obvious trend we see in the last, especially in the last uh, three to two years. Uh, the third trend we see very interesting is the popularity of containers and also uh, container, container orchestration frameworks like Kubernetes. And the whole idea for this is they also do the similar thing. They try to model, um, they define the abstraction for compute and define and put each compute a single, let's like, call this microservice in each single container. And in this way, they can move this container around to different machines. And they all just assume that in, they can just always assume the environment is still identical, although they are now executed on different machines. And orchestration frameworks like Kubernetes will organize this resource into different resource pools. And so it's possible, it's very easy for you to scale up your service. Uh, I, I want to get 10% more uh, machine power for this service. You just scale. 10% more containers, running 10% more containers for this service. Or uh, it's not a big peak time for me. I just want to scale down this uh, sc uh, scale down this service by 50% because it's the middle of night and you can just do so easily with the help like uh, for, from Kubernetes or similar orchestration. So this, what I will call elastic compute will also require you to have a, a different data source and they can run dependently from these computes because this compute will be put into containers and they are controlled and managed, uh, they will be managed by this uh, orchestration frameworks and storage is a very different story. So how to connect them and make them independent. It's very, it's very, uh, it's very challenging actually. A lot of people are taking a look at this problem and try to figure the best way to solve it. And the lastly is, you know, like with the current GBDR requirement, compliance requirement, a lot of people are looking at 
a lot of companies are working day and night to make sure the data is protected and controlled in the right way. And also how to uh, control the data, uh, make the data in full control, but also use the public cloud so I can combine my in-house on-premise capacity, the resource and computing and storage, and also uh, the, the public cloud in a, in a secure way, in an easy way is very important for a lot of companies. Okay, so these are the trends we are seeing in the Valley in the, in the past few years. As I, as I mentioned, they all point into a new architecture that should independently plan and scale compute and storage. Now, so uh, I have a question really quick. So does Amazon provide this um, uh, independently um, scale and storage? That's a great question. So the way if you see if like, I, I just stay on this figure for Amazon, the story is you see the storage as S3. That's the basically the uh, their backhand storage for you that's the build on top of uh, some object store. And for compute, it's up to the users. For example, a lot of users are just renting the EC2 instances on Amazon. And these are just virtual machines, virtual machines in a pool of like a, in a, some data center, but they are not necessarily co-located or even close to the S3 uh, service. Mm. And EC2 instances can be gone if you go free tier. So uh, if you go free tier, in case any big users need more compute power, your compute can be stopped and you just lost the state for a compute. That's very normal. Um, yeah, so so for EC2, for, uh, for Amazon, for any public cloud, uh, the separation for compute and storage is almost by default. So essentially a lot of users, they are talking to us and the reason they talk to us is because they see these issues. Now they move their logic applications to EC2 to, to, or to some other uh, service provided by Amazon, but they want to use S3 as the final data source. And then they see this separated. They either see issues during this com computation, the IO is very slow because they go through a network, uh, the performance issue, or they want to keep a option open so in, the, in later on they can uh, switch from S3 to other public cloud, because if you put all your eggs into one basket, it's always be risky, right? You get, you gradually just lose the bargaining power to the public cloud vendors. So it, yeah, so essentially that's big, that's a big, big uh, drive force behind this separation for, for some people call this disaggregation for compute and storage. Cloud, cloud vendor is one of them, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, so now if you see this stack, how do you make this more cloud native? So what our answer is actually, uh, so these are the challenges you see. Once you go with independent scaling for data, for, for compute and storage, uh, you also see challenges. Like this is the reason why people don't have this on day one, right? Because they have issues. The first issue, first the challenge, to have this new architecture is the data locality. So what data locality mean is, means is uh, you have data locally, you present data locally to the compute. And in the de deeply coupled storage compute case, it's very easy to achieve data locality. For example, the, if the scheduler or the computation knows, okay, I, my task, this is one part of my computation, needs certain data but I know where data is. And this machine also runs compu both compute and storage. Then I will try to schedule my task to the machine. In that case, you can get it running with local data if you, the task get scheduled on the machine. So you get data locality. But now the data source is different. It's on S3 or on some other remote storage. It's no more local. It's hard to move data to the compute or it's very uh, inefficient how do you handle this data locality problem remains very challenging for, it's maybe the biggest the challenging, uh, the, the largest challenge. Also the data abstraction, because now we have in the world, data is separated, storage is separated. We have maybe different ways to store data and maybe even multiple ways at the same time. For example, um, S3 is one way, 
and um, some other storage engine or some other public cloud is a different way. How do I make sure I can talk to, like I have one abstraction, so I don't need to worry about which is the real physical storage for my applications. And another one is data accessibility. Data can be, to, to make sure my application can access data from the different data sources, like in uh, AWS or on Google or on some other on-premise data. So uh, if this is separated. So these are the top challenges we see for a lot of users once they go on this track. The locality issues, accessibility issues, and abstraction, provide abstraction to the data. So yeah, so essentially, if you can provide these three, then we can make this transition very smooth or very efficient. Okay, so this is where we are. Um, so this is, we, we're building a system called Aluxio, and this is origi originally a research project called Tachyon in the UC Berkeley MLAP. lab uh, So it was a PhD thesis for our founder, our CEO, Hao Yuan Li, uh, his PhD thesis. And uh, for, for those of you who doesn't really know UC Berkeley MLAP, lab uh, it, is the, it is the place where Spark, Apache Spark and Apache Mesos get invented and also um, take off. And uh, Apache, so Spark and uh, Spark and Mises are both open source projects. And it's, it's also true for Alexio or in early days, Tachyon. We open source this in the very early days. And uh, I'm now, the company Alexio is behind this open source project to commercialize uh, this project. And we are backed by Andreessen Horowitz, that's the top VC in the Valley. And uh, we get public, um, like there's a lot of media coverage on the, co on the company. For example, in 2018, it is selected by one media as the hottest, top 10 hottest data storage startup. So essentially we're building a virtual unified file system between the storage and the compute. And uh, if we zoom in into this storage, we call this data access layer. We have two different interfaces. We have the app, we call northbound to the upper part, uh, the data abstraction. And typically people use the HDFS interface for us to inter in interact with us. Or sometimes they fuse the POSIX interface to our, which I will show later today, to, in, in, to interact with us. So that uh, with this abstraction on the top, uh, app applications, they don't really need to worry about, oh, how I can interact with this uh, data, right? To the north, to the south side, we provide different drivers. We have built-in HDFS driver, a Swift driver, S3 driver, and a lot more drivers. So we can talk to different storage sources. And in this way, we do the heavy lifting for data applications they don't need to really worry about how data is stored, where this, they are, like what kind of applications or clients you should use, libraries to use uh, to fetch data from there. Um, then we have a question from Eub. Um, is it always a good idea to have both on-premise and remote cloud storage to provide um, data locality in data science applications? Can you repeat the question? Sorry, I didn't hear yeah. this clearly. Okay, sorry. Um, is it always a good idea to have both on premise? And the second question is remote cloud storage to provide data locality in data science applications. So, uh, it, mm, so is it, essentially, yeah. So, is it is it a good idea to have both on premise? So, so if that's the old way to go, right? If it's um, if you have both, you have both storage and compute on premise. That's the old way. And in that case, you don't really need to, I want people still talking about scaling, it, putting them into different pools so they can use different characteristics for, uh, for certain different, for storage, you can use certain, maybe cheaper CPUs, but better hard disk, more hard disk, right? For compute, you may use beefier CPUs, but less powerful or small capacity for hard disks. So definitely you can do that. Actually, a lot of people, even on, on premise, they're doing that. Um, so it's not really, I'm not really saying you have to do this on the cloud, but actually 
um, no matter you're doing on cloud or on premise, we do see the similar trends by separating these different resources together. Yeah. I don't know whether I answered the question. Yeah. Um, yeah, I hope you answered. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so this is really a verge. So basically, this is what we are trying to uh, present is the we're trying to introduce to the stack. Data analytics stack is called a virtual unified file system, and it has different uh, features. For example, we have provides a unified namespace and API translation, and uh, also do the tiering. Um, so, for example, the unified namespace you can mount, you can connect to different data sources together, even they are from different uh, data. They are di different vendors or different types, and they can show us a sim. As a, as a similar type to the applications, uh, which I will actually show an example here uh, in five minutes as a demo. And also because you are, we can do the translation for you, even you talk to us using the HDFS API, which is used by a lot of big data applications like Spark or Presto or uh, Hadoop. And we can still translate this API to some S3 API calls. So the, in the back end, they can be connected to S3. And I will do, this is one more thing. We move bytes to where it's needed. And this is totally transparent to the applications, to the machine learning or big data applications. So we do provide uh, a capacity or capability to handle data caching. Essentially, uh, you can allocate the resource, storage resource to Alexio, and we can just say, okay, this data is very hot. Um, so first time you can read it from S3, it's fine. But next time if you need it, because I cached this already, you will just read from my local storage and this will provide much reduced network latency because you don't need to go through network to read it. And also uh, just also to save your cost, retrieving data from S3 or this kind of cloud storage will just, just, add, just make your bill heavier. Okay, um, I think I talk a lot really in a high level. I don't really like to talk so much only just in the high level, I will do a demo to you to show how we can connect, for example, S3 and also at the same time, uh, Microsoft Azure storage into my local desktop. My, I'm using a MacBook as my local desktop and you can just show, you can see them as the local directory. Okay. So I am right now in, uh, can you see my, Terminal. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I can see yeah. It now. So uh, what I'm showing here is I will first launch Alexio in my local machine, and uh, I will do some very simple commands, and you can see how I can interact with data remotely. First, I will do is to start a single deployment, single machine deployment with one master and one worker, which we'll get to this concept later. But essentially, I'm starting out the service. You see the logs here. Yeah, so we do see a few JVM processes are brought up. So uh, we have one master and worker. And in this case, only matters for the master and the, and the worker. Uh, as a result, you will be able to see a local, you will be able to see a local yeah, this is the web UI for our service. You can see it tells you the machine is running. And right now there's nothing. Uh, I think I have one. We have one directory. And inside this directory, it's empty. Nothing there. So we have one only one directory. So the next thing I will do is to, I have a remote S3 bucket. I want to make this S3 bucket appearing in my local machine. So I will run a command. Okay, so into a Luxu space, we have one more storage. We have one more directory now. It's called S3. 
And inside this S3, we can see there are four different objects. And here it shows the names and the size and whether it's when it's created. But also more importantly, you can see this a number. It shows 0%. That means uh, although we know these objects, but all the data is remote. Locally, I have 0% of the data. Okay. Uh, now I will do a, I will do something to mount another Azure Blob Store. This is a basically from another storage vendor, uh, from public cloud vendor. It's on, it's it it is on Azure Blob Store. Now, if you see this again, we have one more directory, and this directory has a Azure subdirectory. And under this Azure subdirectory, it has one a random file here. So if you do uh, l r, and you see we have different objects, and they mounted it into different directories. But from application's perspective, from Alexio applications perspective, you don't really see the difference, right? You just see this virtualized or, or abstract, uh, a abstraction for the file system and you can operate on them. So one thing I want to show is really, uh, for example, we can do this. Uh, what this this command is doing is to show to get basically get the content for this uh, single object and count how many times we see the word called bunny. It may take some take a while because this file size is one fifty megabytes, and I'm downloading from S three. Okay, it takes nine seconds in total, and there are nine oh seven occurrences for the word bunny in this file. But now, if you see again, it shows data is 100%. That means because I read this data once, and Alexa knows, OK, this is data seems like you are likely to visit uh, very soon. So we can just try to run this. Uh, we can just cache it locally. So what we do is, you can, if you run this command again. So it's basically downloading the data on your machine. Yeah, and now this time it's very fast. It's less. It's like a three seconds, and the reason is because we have this data already cached on my local machine. Okay, still oh. we are still playing with using the Alexi client CLI to work with the data. Now we can even do some fancier stuff. There is a question uh, from Suresh. Yeah, does it handle different storages, different data formats? Does it involve any conversion, memory at speed of data? So we support certain uh, cloud, as I a, said, as a, like cloud storage. Uh, we most, most of the cloud storage we support. And there are also other uh, storage devices or storage, storage services. There's a long list, maybe 10 or up to or maybe 20. Um, you can check out our website. So as long as we support this, uh, you can just connect Computer, you can use the driver, preview driver to connect to the storage services. And if you are interested to come up with your own uh, storage, we can also, we also have the predefined uh, APIs. It's very easy to use. So a lot of people are actually doing, um, a lot of people are contributing their own drivers to our, because we are open source, open source uh, community. So they are contributing their own drivers to the, our repository and we can so in that way we can be able to we will be able to talk to different storage uh, does that answer the question um Suresh, i hope this answered your question i think the other part of the question was also does it um oh yeah yeah he said yeah yeah yeah, answered, yeah. okay good good okay so the next comment i'm running here is really to have this, if you can see, 
to mount this. So remember, now we have all the different two storage public clouds uh, showing up as one single namespace. And we can even make this look like in the local storage. So we have the Fuse API by running this. By running this, we have this mounted into a uh, local storage. And you can use the, for example, I'm using a Mac. You can, you can tell from that, right? You can see these just like in your local machine. And you can pretty much open this. For example, I'm just. Uh, oh, this There's is another question from Eub. Um, yeah. If you can comment on any possible latency issues while consuming, for example, real time sensor data. Uh, actually, I opened my chat. Can you comment on any possible latency issues while consuming, for example, real time sensor data? Um, so, we do have a lot of use cases. They try to use this as a way to come up to as a workaround as the latency issue. For example, they have data in a remote storage and they want to really reduce the latency to fetch data and use this as, the, as a way to, to shield this latency uh, to, to help to improve the performance for sure. Uh, I feel I know less about uh, real-time sensor data, um, but I do a lot of people actually, uh, today I have a call with the, some uh, famous startup in the, in the Valley and they're trying to use this as a way to um, store their, their user events, uh, this kind of like a, a real-time data. So the data can be very soon be available to add different applications um, before they aggregated a lot of data to S3. So definitely we know people are using, exploring Luxio in a way to handle, to help their real, real-time use cases. Okay, uh, so essentially, yeah. So with the, our Fuse API, you will be able to uh, just normally interact with this. Uh, I will just maybe, okay. So essentially you can just go to mount Fuse using terminal. Yeah, this is easier. Right, so you can just use this. Yeah, so this is the content. I can basically I'm using my uh, note tab to interact with them, just like interacting with the local machine. So uh, this Fuse API or POSIX API is particularly very useful for a lot of machine learning applications uh, because a lot of machine learning frameworks they are designed to deal with the local directory rather than a remote or shared directory distributed storage. And using this way, the data is actually backed by a lot of different uh, storage, can be potentially different storage, but actually it provides one physical a consistent view to the local consumer. And it also for big data applications, typically they don't interact with the data using POSIX API or like a, the folder, like a local directory. Rather, they use uh, HDFS APIs in this way they get locality because HDFS API will tell them, will tell the computation scheduler a lot more additional information. Okay, so let's see again. Uh, uh, because I just opened one more file, right? So if you do this, you see another file, this file is also 100% because I just opened that. So next time, if you just open, it will be very fast. Okay, uh, so much for the demo. We also have a cool thing called, uh, I will show you in the slides actually. Yeah. There's a cool thing called Sandbox. It's a different way. So I just showed the way you can just run Alexa in a local machine to connect to different S3 buckets or some Azure buckets. Uh, and there's a, uh, there's a way to install Alexio on S3 
oh, sorry, on EC2 machines and connect to some predefined buckets. And you just fill in this form and this will give you access to such a class, four node cluster with pre-installed Spark and allows you for uh, a day, you can play with that. It's, it's for free, adding no cost to you. So we can just play with it. Yeah, I can just briefly introduce some real world use cases. Uh, so Dalia, how much time I have left? Oh, we have 15 minutes more. Okay. Yeah, so uh, essentially we have a lot of known production use cases. And uh, it's deployed in a significant way in different companies in production already in the past few years. Um, I want to introduce one uh, few interesting, uh, few interesting use cases, and this is the use case from Barclay. Barclay is the one major company in uh, bank, bank, and what we're doing here is to provide a caching layer for their Spark. So when the Spark is reading data from their Terra data and they will use Alexio as the caching layer. Um, previously, they see a lot of issues because the uh, bad network bandwidth or because of some uh, issues during, between the connection. So they, um, sometimes they see the Spark data fails. Spark jobs fail a lot. Now with Alexio inside and caching the input data, they see the jobs becomes much more stable. And this, they see a lot performance gain on top of that. Uh, another one is really, this is one of the top online retailers in the US. We have one, Alexio, as a similar use case, we have, they have HDFS, but their HDFS is highly, is oversubscribed. So basically, uh, too many jobs are read, trying to read from HDFS. And later on, they put this in the middle. Uh, what you can do is, you can serve data from memory layer, and this will have much higher bandwidth. And in this way, we can see a much better performance. Uh, they see like a 10x faster for a lot of data queries. And this is the, uh, this is an interesting case because th uh, this is a top telecom, telecom company here and they have different uh, clusters and they use Alexio as the virtualization or uh, logic data layer on top of different uh, physical storage. So they provide a consistent view to one single, provide a one single consistent view to their machine learning applications. And in this case, they see uh, they're not just on performance, but more on the um, simplified development cycles and also make the life for their data scientists much easier. Uh, before they have to write applications to, they call ETL applications to move data around from one cluster to another so they can do some cross cluster data analysis. But right now with this uh, physical view, with, with this logic view to hide the difference between physical storage, they don't really need to write the ETL jobs to do this data import and output. They just use this um, and avoid data duplication too. And you just need data on demand. You can just process data on demand. Yeah, uh, so the rest of the part of the slides is really about uh, some implementation insights because we have been working on this for the past the four or five years. So there are some design lessons, but I think uh, unless people are working in the distributed system land, I will not really uh, go this deep. But uh, instead, do, do people have any question? Otherwise, we can still go through the slides regarding the architecture, regarding the uh, use case, regarding like what potentially you can do with this logic file system on top of a physical remote slow st stores. Uh, no, no, no questions so far, but I'll let you know if we have any questions, no worries. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, so let's go deeper, a little bit deeper into the slides. For example, we can, what we can do is to, this is the architecture. We have the clients, we have the workers, and the master is the components in Alexio to store all the data, like metadata service, which files, how many files, 
uh, what are the metadata information for the file, like owner, group, um, access bits, this kind of information, they are stored on a master nodes. And there are worker nodes, and they are responsible for storing and serving the data. And also we have the underscore, in this case, like as I said, as I showed in a demo, one underscore is S3, and then one, another underscore is uh, Azure Blob Store. And in this case, we can mount both into the service and provide a consistent logic view. There's a question from Suresh. Uh, memory at speed of data. Can you elaborate on it? Maybe uh, this is what I said, or this is something from our website. But essentially, mm, oh, OK. So maybe what I meant is memory speed of data. So basically, it, it, because we, Alexio, in early days, it's famous for building a in-memory storage. And we leverage the main, main memory as the main storage. And in this case, basically, we are serving data from main memory. And uh, so it will be just faster than serving data from hard disk. And this is basically in the early days where we are start. Um, oh, just talking about maybe a bit of history of Luxio. So as I mentioned, in the early days, it's a research project called Tycan. And at that time, uh, what people see a problem is, at that time, it's, it's, it's from UC Berkeley M lab. And that time, a lot of the researchers from la that lab were investigating how to uh, improve Spark. And uh, one Apache Spark, and you know, like a Spark is very famous in the early days about the in-memory process. So people were talking about Spark, but they say, okay, Spark is good, but we don't have so much memory and we know all different Spark jobs, they cannot really share data and they all cache their data internally in these different Spark processes. So this is a lot of waste of memory resource. As we know, um, there might be some common data shared by all different applications. So uh, that's something the researchers try to address. They come up with the research idea called Tacan, which is the orange, like the, the original uh, code name for Alexio. And with Tacan, you can share data in memory. And Spark can directly talk to Tacan layer. At that time, uh, Spark, Spark 1.x, Tacan is the default of heap block manager for Spark. And in that case, they can, Spark can just talk directly to Alexio to get data in memory speed. Uh, so that's a lot of people know Alexio or Tacan um, in that sense because we are providing the in memory blocks, many of heap block store for these different applications. And later on, we actually extend the concept, not really just handling data on storing data on memory, but you can also configure Alexio to handle data on uh, SSD or hard disk. We have the tier concepts. So you can just basically handle storage resource to Alexio. And then Alexio will help you to uh, say, okay, I want to have this data. Um, this is hot, let's put it in the top tier. Otherwise it's a stale, let's move it to, down to a next tier or it's really cold, now let's just evict this data out. And all this, all this, applica uh, all this logic, all the process is transparent to the users. But still, um, if you use memory as the storage tier, top storage tier, uh, we will serve data at a memory speed. Um, so I there see- There are some more questions, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah I, I just opened the chat box so I can see the question now. Um, the next question, how would your architecture work if I have Cassandra instead of HDFS? So Cassandra is more like a big table or some uh, basically structured data service here. Um, right now, we do not directly talk to Cassandra and we do, um, I do know people use Cassandra, but in the context that they will write their own logic to convert, to read data from Cassandra and write it to Alexio and then that Alexio or applications on top of Alexio to consume the data. But yeah, right now we don't directly, we don't have a Cassandra driver in, in a short way. Um, so I think workers are able to translate APIs based on underlying DB. Yeah, as I said, like we don't have really underlying DB, we have underlying FS 
cloud system or underlying object store. Um, how do you spam workers by Docker or Kubernetes? You can do this either way. We support, we have doc, we have pre-built Docker images, and we also have integration uh, with Kubernetes. Uh, you can just run commands to launch Alexio as a Kubernetes native application. We do have that. Uh, you can search on our website. We have documentation on that. Um, so I see Suresh, one question, what are the limitations? Can you provide me more context? Limitation regarding what? Oh, limitation regarding Alexio. Uh, of course, uh, any, any system has a lot of limitation. Um, and, and so, as, for example, we are on the, on the roadmap. Uh, so, okay, some context. We are releasing a 2.0 release very soon as a preview release. 2.0 preview release will be, uh, will be out maybe this week or next week. Yeah, so during the 2.0, we're addressing a lot of the existing, uh, uh, existing limitations. For example, uh, how do you handle a lot of small files? And we know that previous for HDFS or similar systems, they are not designed for handling small files efficiently. Yeah, so how can we handle that? Our first step is to move our, for example, metadata store uh, from on-heap storage, on-heap concurrent map to some off-heap storage engines like RocksDB. So this is basically one of the first step. And also how to reduce the external like a dependency. Uh, if you run Alexa in a high availability mode, you need to have Zookeeper or some also HDFS previously. You have the zookeeper and HDFS to uh, coordinate different masters. As, as I see, as, as you can see in this diagram, you have multiple. You can have multiple masters, and they are coordinated by zookeeper, right? And we can now uh, eliminate the dependency on zookeeper by having masters talking to each other using some consensus protocol like Raft, right? So these are all ongoing things, ongoing efforts. And for sure, like we want to also provide some other uh, abstractions. Right now, we provide a virtualized file system, a logic file system. Like we can also provide maybe a logic table or a logic KV system to the users. In that sense, will make more will make more sense to connect to underlying DB. And um, and there is a lot of ongoing work. For example, we also added a lightweight uh, distributed computation engine into Alexio in the latest version. But right now, we only support very limited operations. For example, pers distributed persist, uh, dis distributed load, can load data in a distributed way from the Android store to Alexio, or uh, distributed copy if you want to copy a very large file or maybe a file with a, a directory with a lot of different files to a different location. Uh, these kind of operations, we provide initial implementation with this lightweight um, uh, IO implement, with lightweight IO implement, IO computation. But you can do definitely more. For example, you can maybe add some logic to transfer, to transform data from one format to another, or from maybe Cassandra to Alexio as the files, or doing some compression, all different things you can do, but we just don't have it right now. Uh, you can use this as a platform to do that. Um, yeah. Yeah, I believe we're a little bit running out of time. So yeah. uh, let me just maybe quickly go through the most sure. important of things. Course. Yeah. Uh, so this is the architecture, and this is the logic, basically the files, logic files and blocks internally in Alexio. Logic files are divided into different blocks, and blocks are the basic granularity you do caching or do the eviction and you can specify the you can customize the block size and different uh, different paths i will just skip all these different parts um and I, by the way i can just share the slides later on people are interested you can just go through the slides yeah actually uh, some attendees ask for the slides if you have it somewhere in the cloud yeah, will be I will share the to, to share the, the link yeah Great. yeah so yeah, this is maybe one important slide to remember. Basically, we can you can just mount different external storage to the single namespace and provide this logic view to the applications. 
And this shows an example with S3 and also with HDFS. Uh, we have replications, we have location policies. Uh, yeah, that's basically, that's, that's uh, my talk. All right. Um, so if you have the slide somewhere on the cloud, it would be really nice if you share the link to the two attendees in the chat. Yeah. Um, yeah, and thank you so much, Ben. Uh, we really appreciate your effort and time for today. And thank you everyone who joined us online. So we are running out of time. If you have time, we have a small poll, a small survey. Um, we're really interested what you are interested in to, um, for the next webinars. And yeah, see you next time. And thank you, Ben, again. Hope to see you thank slides. You. Thank you, Dottie.